and other brassicas. And so natural pest regulation is the process by which populations of those kind of animals and animals are regulated by predators and parasitoids, such as these two. This beetle is Bembidian lampros, a, a common predatory carabid, which is known to eat the cabbage root fly larvae. And there's a parasitoid, Tribliographa, which is associated with this species. Natural pest regulation is a complex ecological process and it's about uh, trying to manage the ecosystem so that these two things on the right are boosted and these things on the left are lower. It's a regulatory process. As you can imagine, as you're all mostly ecologists, it's, it's not that easy to do that in the modern farming systems. But it does fit in modern farming systems, and I think this is where it fits. It's an element of integrated pest management. Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is a toolkit of management actions and techniques to control pests and weeds and diseases. And the, the idea of it really is to ensure that you're using the minimum pesticide input. So you're targeting or you're using it the, only when you really need to use pesticides. So pesticides, insecticides, herbicides become a last resort in integrated pest management. They're not the first port of call. They're the last thing you do, and that should reduce your overall use. This IPM is strongly supported at the moment in European policy. We'll see how it goes, but I, th there's quite a lot of policy weight behind this being a way to go. And managing natural ecosystems to enhance the natural pest regulation service, for me, is the first stage of IPM. It's the first port of call. Pesticides, the last port of call. The first thing you do is manage a system so that your environment delivers the best natural pest regulation that it can. So that's where it fits in modern farming. What I'm going to talk about today started with a couple of different projects, a European project called Biodiversity Knowledge and a UK knowledge exchange program funded by the Natural Environment Research Council on sustainable food production. And they both came to this same question, and the question came from policymakers and stakeholders. And it was this, which types of landscape management are effective at maintaining or increasing natural pest regulation? In the European project, it actually came from the ministries, the environmental or agriculture ministries of Austria and France. So it really was a question from policymakers. How do we, what do we do to enhance this natural pest regulation service? And what I'm going to show you is that we, we identified in the course of the process 92 different things you can do to enhance natural pest regulation. They include things like planting flowering crop plants or wildflowers in strips. They include uh, lines of grassy mound that are called beetle banks, and many, many other different things. We actually found 3,947 different experimental studies testing the effectiveness of these different actions. And that's experimental studies where the, the scientists or the researchers involved have gone in, made the intervention, and compared its effects with not doing it. So here's the process we followed. There's a lot more detail about this in the, in the published paper if you're interested in finding out more. It's basically three different stages. There was first a systematic search, which is using systematic map methods. Then something called a standardized synopsis, where you take the studies that have been identified in the systematic map and you actually summarize them in plain English so that they can be quickly read and understood by anyone who's interested. And we did this stage for a subset of the practices. This is, this is the number of practices here was 17, and then we identified a full 92 different practices. We summarized 22 of them, and that was because we didn't have the resources to summarize the evidence for all 92. Uh, and the final stage that I'll talk about is an expert panel assessment, which gives you a way to get from this complex body of evidence through to an answer. There were lots of different points, five different points at which stakeholders were involved in this. The first two were in selection of the topic. So we had governments, we had a mixed group of stakeholders in the UK. They helped us to decide that this was the question we wanted to ask. The next two points of interaction were on which practices to include. We didn't just decide what the practices were ourselves. We consulted very widely on what the different practices might be that real farmers would actually do to enhance natural pest regulation. And then there was a prioritization process with a different group of stakeholders, government, regulators, business people, NGOs were all involved in these stages. And that was to narrow down a list or to tell us which the priorities were. And the final stage where stakeholders were involved is in the assessment of evidence. So what you see here is a, a, a logical series of steps from a large volume of disparate evidence to a simple, easy to understand answer for use in policy and practice. Just to give you an idea of what the evidence, uh, what the body of evidence is like numerically, this is a frequency histogram of all those 3,900 and odd studies. 
and this is how many practices have this many studies. So you can see that most of the practices have a very small number of studies that actually tested them. Only about two have no studies at all. But some of the practices have absolutely loads of studies, hundreds of studies. So this one here, which had 570 different studies, is plant more than one crop per field. That is intercropping, basically, planting more than one crop in the same place. And remember, all of these studies have actually measured the effects of, um, on natural pest regulation. So they've either measured natural enemies, or they've measured the pest regulation service, or they've measured the crop damage, or some, some, some aspect of natural pest regulation. This one here is about 375 studies on reduced tillage. Reduced tillage is a practice that uh, has, has been widely put in place in, in some parts of the world, and there is some good effort to synthesise the evidence for the effects of reduced tillage on some ecosystem services, but I don't think on natural pest regulation, as far as I know. There's a lot of evidence out there. Here is uh, an intervention, or a couple of interventions that are basically flower strips, the effect of putting flower strips in, so you might know some of that evidence. More than 100 studies testing that. So, unfortunately, none of these we were able to include in our summaries because we just didn't have the resource to summarise all that evidence, and maybe a different, more systematic or quantitative approach is, is appropriate for those. What the, the, the studies, we, the, the actions that we did summarise, the evidence is presented like this on the website called conservationevidence.com, and it's summarised in plain English, and then all of the studies about each action are summarised further according to the... the outcomes that they're measuring. So broken down into things like parasitism, natural enemies, effects on pests, effects on crop damage, effect on yield and profit and cost. So if anything, you could sort of see this as, a, as like a theory of change. How does, how does it work if you're trying to enhance natural pest regulation? You're going to do something which enhances the natural enemies, and those natural enemies are going to control the pests, and when you control the pests, you'll have less damage. When you have less damage, you'll have more yield, then you might have more money. And every stage of that really needs evidence to support it because it's not a, a given <laughs> if you incre increase the natural enemies you get more yield. The final stage of this was an expert assessment. So we, we gathered 16 stakeholders from research and NGOs and industry and they read the evidence for these interventions. The names, you probably can't see that at the bottom, but the names and organisations will be on this final slide so you can see who is involved in this. Each of those people scored and commented on the effectiveness, the certainty and any negative side effects. We had two rounds of scoring, and the interventions were then placed into categories. And this is how we assigned the categories. So you end up with a final score for effectiveness and certainty. And if something is very effective and very certain, we're very certain the evidence is very good quality, it ends up with this beneficial. We know that it works. If it's very ineffective, very low effectiveness score, but very high certainty, then it gets likely to be ineffective. We know quite well that it doesn't work. And these are all judgments, but they're judgments by a group of people made repeatedly following a kind of something like a Delphi process where everyone's scoring separately. That's what it looks like without any, with a low score for negative side effects. If you do have negative side effects, we change the beneficial category so that their side effects are, are come up with over 20% and there's good evidence of effectiveness. You have a trade off between benefits and harms. So here are the results. We now have these 21 interventions or actions to enhance natural pest regulation sorted into these categories. It's just a list, but it's an extremely quick way of conveying all this information. This is based, remember, on hundreds and hundreds of studies that have been assessed. So I'll just point out that three of these have got this little star, and that means that they were selected as a priority in a stakeholder consultation. And two of the ones with the star have ended up in this unknown effectiveness category which just, you know, these are the research priorities. These are the things the stakeholder community want to know about, but we don't have enough evidence to be sure. And that first one that's pointed out with the arrow there, use pesticides only when pest or crop damage reaches threshold levels. There is actually quite good evidence that that approach, only treating when thresholds are exceeded, is quite good for um, controlling pests. You can use less pesticide and you get pest control, but what there wasn't evidence for is that that is delivered by an enhanced natural pest regulation service. So that's why it's in the unknown, even though there's quite a lot of evidence that it's, it's a good way to, that you can reduce your pesticide use in that way. I'm just going to talk very briefly about three different examples here. The first one is the push-pull system, the only one that comes out as beneficial. And that's where you have something in the, tr in, the, in the crop which repels or pushes away the pest and something outside the crop which attracts it. There's very good evidence that this works. It's all from small maize farms in Kenya and South Africa. So it's, it's very limited in scope, but it's really excellent. There's really good studies. There's, a, there's evidence of, of 
better yield and better profitability as a result of doing this. So this system works and there's a lot of scope for more research. Crop rotation, we limited ourselves to crop rotations involving potatoes because of the volume of evidence for all crop rotation. This comes out as having trade-offs and it's because the effects vary depending on the rotation and the pest. It's effective for Colorado potato beetle but less effective for lesion nematodes and diseases. So some of the studies show an increase in pest species and that's why it gets this trade-off category. It works but there might be some disbenefits. And finally, beetle banks. These are very widely known, certainly in the UK, as, as enhancing the, the predatory beetles, and so they're supposed to be good for pest regulation. They come out as unlikely to be beneficial, which irked quite a lot of people, but we went through the process. I didn't do the scoring. The stakeholders did it. They looked at the evidence. They scored it again. And the reason for this is that although the beetle banks increase natural enemies and reduce pests are shown in or very close to the banks, enhanced pest regulation is not shown very far into the crop fields. And there are quite good studies looking at this. In fact, hedge bottoms have more predators in two UK studies than the beetle banks do. So it comes out with this. Now, that doesn't mean it's always going to stay like that. There might be some killer evidence that comes out very soon that shows that it really does work right in the crop, but I, I wait to see that. So just to summarise everything I've said, I hope I've shown that a large evidence base can be summarised into simple messages for policy and practice. You can involve stakeholders at many different points along the way, the push-pull system seems to work, so can it be scaled up? And the, the timeless message, there is loads more research and loads more evidence synthesis needed if we're to really move towards science-based sustainable agriculture. And here are the credits. So th this is the people who did the assessment, these are the people who helped write the paper, and these are the funders and institutions where I've been working. Thank you for listening. Thirty-second question. If some information that's very easy to access that says this was beneficial but the studies only happened in Kenya and South Africa and it was only on maize. So we produced a document that went with this assessment which is called a guide to agronomists for enhancing natural pest regulation and it has the, the assessment but also these points that were raised during the discussion with things like that. We, did, we also had a, a score in the process of doing that on the, the geographic range of the results so we all were very aware that it was only in Africa but, but I agree, we need to take that into account. Thanks very much then. Sorry to... It's okay. Sorry? Reduce the lighting. Reduce the lighting. Uh, I'll go ask one of the questions in a minute, but thanks for pointing that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Oh, sorry, should we reduce the lighting? Gorilla furniture removal. So um, while we're having a quick run around with that, I'm afraid we'll, uh, we'll just carry on with the next. We have um, Claudia Havranek from the University of Oxford who is going to talk to us about Brexit. So this should be interesting. Hi everyone, um, I'm Claudia and I'm in the third year of my PhD at Oxford. And I'm going to be talking to you, as was just introduced, about some opportunities we might have in agro-environmental schemes in leaving the EU. I'm going to start off by just giving you a brief background of agro-environmental schemes in the context of the CAP. Then I'm going to talk to you about a case study um, of hedgerows and margins in the UK and a bit of the fieldwork I've been doing. And finally, I'm going to give you a take-home message on what Brexit will mean in the context of agro-environmental schemes in the UK. So the common agricultural policy, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is this EU-based farming policy. And as part of it, in the UK, we have agro-environmental schemes. And these were introduced in 1991 in the form of the Countryside Sh Stewardship Scheme. The aim of agro-environmental schemes is to protect the environment. And with 70% of the UK committed to agriculture, it's a really good place for the UK to tackle our conservation efforts kind of three ways of looking at agro-environmental schemes. You can look at the ecological impacts, 
You can look at the economics of the schemes, and you can also look at the way farmers react to them. So where are we now with agro-environmental schemes? Well, the EU uses one uh, indicator of environmental health and farmland, and that's the farmland birds. And since agro-environmental schemes have been introduced, the farmland birds have shown decline. At a UK level, they also look at butterflies and bats, and butterflies have been shown to decline, and bats have been shown to be staying at the same level, and in recent years, they've gone up slightly. Economically, um, there's a lot of money as part of the cap. We're sending a lot of money out to the EU, and it's coming back in the form of direct payments. We've got £2.5 billion coming into farming. So there is an opportunity, potentially, in the future to improve efficiency. Rather than sending the money out to the EU and having it come back, we could just keep the money in the UK. And finally, farmers. Um, 5.1 million hectares of the UK is committed to lower-level schemes. 1.5 million committed to higher-level schemes, which leaves roughly 10 million hectares not in schemes at all. The NFU has produced a document on farming and Brexit, and one of the key points they've said is that farmers do want to have an environmental role, so they do want to be involved. So I've been looking at one key aspect of UK farmland, which is hedgerows and margins. If you think about farmland in France, Germany, one of the main differences with farming we have here is that we have these hedgerows and margins, and they're something that the UK really wants to protect. A hedgerow is a boundary line of trees or shrubs more than 20, uh, 20 metres long, less than 5 metres wide, and with fewer than 20 metre gaps. So as you can see from these pictures, these are just a variety of hedgerows and some of them have associated margins with them. Some of them have different adjacent land uses. Um, I'm looking at hedgerows and margins in the context of they're a protected feature. What can we learn from hedgerows and margins in terms of agro-environmental schemes in general, and how can we make them better? My work has been focusing on establishing the most important factors in affecting plant diversity and margins. The idea behind this is that if you get the plants right, the other species will follow. So if we can get the plant diversity in our farmland right, hopefully we can get the other levels of diversity right too. So I've been doing field work in Ditchley Park, which is in Oxfordshire. Um, it's a mixed farm, 1,600 hectares. So that's about 10 times the size of an average UK farm, um, 20 miles north of Oxford. And they've got the same management across all of the farm, so I can look into the factors affecting the plant diversity across a really wide area. The first thing I did was identify hedgerows and margins remotely. Then I went out to the field site and identified key margin characteristics. I then surveyed the margin plant diversity. And finally, what I wanted to do was try and identify the key margin characteristics which most affect plant diversity and see whether agro-environmental schemes are actually paying out for the factors which are more important preferentially. So hedgerow identification was the first thing. Um, I tried to do it initially off-site using satellite imagery. So this is just Google Earth. It was free. Um, I identified 167 hedgerows. Then when I went out there, I identified 89 hedgerows, which I could go out and revisit and look at the plant diversity in the margins there. Um, the point of this picture was to show that here, we've got no hedgerow, but if you look at it from Google Images, it looks like there is one, whereas here, you do have a hedgerow, which is why so many of the sites I couldn't actually visit when I went out there. My plant surveys, um, I just placed one by one meter quadrats um, over the whole margin. So for example, in this margin, you'd have a meter here, a meter here, and a meter here. That meant um, roughly six quadrats per hedgerow, and for each quadrat, I measured abundance and species. So this is what I came up with. I did an ordination um, between nine different factors, different environmental factors connected to the hedgerows, which I could measure. And then I looked at the plant community composition. The important thing, if you're not familiar with ordination, to know is that the longer the arrow, and these arrows relate to the factors tested, the more important the factor was in affecting plant community composition. So these arrows are color-coded according to these three factors. Um, 
initially I tested factors and then plotted them on. There was a heck of a lot of arrows, and that accounted for about 25% of the variation in plant diversity in the margins. So then I pulled out the three most important factors, which accounted for 16% of the variation, and that was orientation, so is your hedgerow running north-south or east-west, margin width on both sides of the hedgerow, and adjacent land use, so was your margin next to a crop, or was it next to a road or a track? Then what I tried to do was, I said, from my ordination, I can see that margin width is a pretty important factor. Um, if I look at it as a factor on its own, is it still important? And in terms of species richness and species diversity, you can clearly see here that margin width doesn't seem to be affecting species richness or diversity. That would suggest that either there are interaction effects going on, um, which mean that margin width is only important in accordance with some of the other factors I previously tested, um, I haven't got onto this, but the next bit I'll be doing is some mixed effects models to test that. Or it could be that the plant community composition is being affected by margin width, but it's actually you're getting different species. So maybe you're getting more rarer species or more species in decline in wider margins than in the narrower margins. And that's not something that species richness or species diversity can actually tell you on its own. So how does this link back to agro-environmental schemes? Well, at the moment, agro-environmental schemes pay for you to either have a six-meter margin next to your hedgerow or to not have a margin at all. They pay out for length, but width isn't very important. What I suspect, and kind of anecdotally from what I've looked at, is that width is important. Where you're getting the rarer species is in the wider margins. And so the current agro-environmental schemes is possibly less effective than it could be. So what are my conclusions? Well, ecologically, we've got a really big opportunity now for reform. We've got a really big opportunity for us to change these overall trends of species decline. And as I've suggested, this could include plants to be included in our new schemes. Economically, we're in a period of very high uncertainty. We don't know how much money the government is going to put into these new schemes. There's the possibility, as I mentioned before, of increased efficiency, but we can't guarantee that. Um, in terms of farmers, farmers do want to be included. From this NFU report, we see that they do want to be included in the environmental aspect, and one of the things they pointed out is they want to avoid unnecessary complexity. So going back to the margin width example, it's easier for a farmer to manage fewer, wider margins than to have to go out and manage a lot of narrow margins. And so if the ecological results of wider margins having more rarer species does hold true, then you can have something which is both ecologically more effective and is also more appealing to farmers. So what's my take-home message? Well, I think given this really big economic uncertainty, it's all the more important to get the ecological aspects of agro-environmental schemes right. And to do that, we're going to need, as I mentioned in the last talk, a lot more research. Thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to thank my supervisor, Stephen Harris, and Owen Turner, Ellen Stickland, and Nick Crank for their help in field work. Um, my research has been funded by the Oxford HGH Wills Charitable Trust, and my email address is up there. If anyone's working on anything similar or has any insights, it would be really, really good to hear from you. So please do actually email me or come and talk to me. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. That was great. Um, any questions for Claudia? So I was thinking, just having spoken anecdotally to farmers, it's easier for them to, if they have to do certain management techniques, it's easier for them to have to only go to one location to do that. So rather than having maybe three metre margins on both sides of a hedgerow, it's easier for them to go and just mow a six metre margin on one side. Pardon? How 
Yeah. So I was looking at, um, DEFRA has this like hedgerow handbook where if you want to go and survey a hedgerow, these are all the factors you have to measure. So I went out and looked at these 89 hedgerows according to the DEFRA handbook, and then I pulled out the factors which were important, well, from there, which I thought could be ecologically applied um, because the data is out there. And I'm going to test this on a lot of other farms using a much wider data set to see if it holds true. So I was trying to find data which already exists for a lot of other places. Yes, I'm going to use the microphone because nobody can hear back here when you don't, so perhaps future people could use it. Um, who sets the, the, the rules for uh, agri-environment schemes? Are they set within the UK or currently, or are they all set in Brussels? I don't actually know. We're going to be talking about that, Jonathan. <laughs> well, that's great, but I, mean, I just want to point out that it actually may not be an opportunity of Brexit. We may just change the rules out if they're down to us anyway. There are so many things people are blaming on Brussels, which actually are locally determined already. So I just raise that. I may be wrong, but... They're, they're actually UK. Um, it's the UK that sets their own agri-environment. So Brexit is relevant. From pillar two, we're not pillar one. Pillar one's EU-based. And evidence-free. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Any more? Have we got time for one more question? Sorry, just so I have to use the microphone at the back. Um, it's not working. It's not working. Can you hear me anyway? Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, you said that you're looking to apply this on a wider scale. Um, yeah. I'm wondering what sort of data might be available for measuring floral diversity, bearing in mind the statement you made that plant diversity is a basis for diversity of anything higher in terms of like birds or invertebrates that you might looking at, be looking at. So do you mean what data already exists? Yes. Um, so on a one by one kilometer square, presence absence data is there. Um, in terms of data at this scale that I'm looking at, it doesn't really exist. Um, the thing that does exist is these surveys for hedgerows, which are actually just looking at the hedgerow structure, not at the margins. Does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, just wondering if you considered anything like land cover maps or NVC classification data? Yeah, I have, and I'll be building that in, but I think what I want to do is on the more fine scale, I want to actually go out there and look at some farms which are part of the scheme, some parts that aren't, and then talk to the farmers, try and understand what's going on. Okay. Thank you. Right, great. So next up we have Claire Pinches and Steve Peel, who are apparently doing a double act. Yes, that's right. Uh, and they're both from Natural England. Um, so, great. Thanks. Morning, everybody. Um, yes, I, I've got a rather provocative title, and thank you to, for, for Bill for, for being here. Um, <laughs> during, um, during Bill's presidential address at the last, last, uh, last year's AGM, he asserted that... Uh, 34 to 58% of agri-environment interventions were ineffective, with the implication being that there was a resultant squandering of significant amounts of money or, and effort on well-intended but um, ineffectual uh, and largely untested land management interventions. And um, we noted that there was really there was no um, qualification of the scope of the assessment. Um, you know, was it global? Was it European? Or was it national? Um, and my colleague uh, Steve Peel and I wanted an opportunity, really, to um, to uh, uh, well, we were concerned that there may have been a false impression that our schemes weren't delivering as they should be because they weren't based on sound science. So we have um, two objectives today, really. Um, firstly, to describe how a well-established and extensive evidence base has been really central to the development and design of the most recent agri-environment schemes, and I'll be using grassland options for restoration and recreation as an example. And then secondly, um, to explore the reasons why delivery of biodiversity outcomes may actually be less than optimal, despite this good, the good synthesis of evidence into um, scheme design and, um, and uh, the options. So we're doing a double act. I'm up first. I'm talking the first stuff. and um, Steve is, um, 
is up second. So if you want the full picture, stay seated and stay tuned. So my outline is firstly to give a brief history of Brassland R&D and agri-environment schemes, um, then talk about the key conclusions basically from the extensive work that has been undertaken, particularly on grassland restoration and recreation, and also then to talk about how we've used this, these findings to help ensure that the right option is targeted to the right place, that the management put in place will deliver the desired outcome, so the management prescriptions that we, we um, ask farmers to, to put in place, and that the outcome set for the farmer can be realistically delivered within the agreement term. So that's by setting indicators of success. So, a brief history of um, agri-environment. Well, the approach of paying farmers um, to prevent actions leading to environmental damage was pioneered in the, um, on the, in the trial in the Halvergate Marshes um, back in the mid-80s, where many farmers were basically uh, persuaded not to drain um, and plough marshland in, in exchange for payments. Agri-environment schemes formally started in, um, in England in 1987, um, with the environmentally sensitive areas, the ESAs, operating in 22 geographically discrete areas um, as a response to uh, rapid agricultural intensification and the associated loss of wildlife value and landscape character. And in 1991, the um, Countryside Stewardship Scheme, the first Countryside Stewardship Scheme, was launched um, to basically uh, provide a, uh, an agri-environment scheme in, outside those 22 areas. So, collectively, those two schemes, ESAs and Countryside Stewardship, are called the classic schemes. Um, and, it, to be completely blunt, the, um, you know, their, their environmental ambitions were relatively modest at that time. And the, um, the, the, the management encompassed within them was quite inflexible. There were fairly rigid prescriptions. So, for example, the uh, grassland recreation scheme, um, grassland re recreation options, uh, were really largely um, intended and um, designed to basically um, deliver for landscape rather than biodiversity. Um, in terms of the underpinning R&D, prior to really um, the well, 1990, there had been quite ad hoc research on grassland restoration and recreation. So, Probably some of you are familiar with the work that Terry Wells did at the ITE, Institute of Terrestrial Ecology, and you know that Charlie, White, um, Charlie Gibson did at Whiteham. But really, it was, um, it was the advent of um, uh, the jointly run DEFRA and um, uh, English Nature and Natural England programme of agri-environment scheme uh, research and development and monitoring and evaluation that really gave, provided us with the money to, 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 to basically commission um, a, a, a big suite of projects which, which improved our evidence base. And the BD numbers up here basically refer to discrete projects which have contributed to that, that um, extensive and um, deep evidence base. Now, the first tranche of, uh, of uh, restoration and enhancement projects were focused on understanding the management techniques to basically increase the diversity of botanically poor or um, um, arable, basically reverting grassland on arable land. And the second tranche of restoration and enhancement projects were about um, basically understanding the ecological, ecological mechanisms um, which were affecting the success of, um, of those restorations and understanding which particular traits meant species were successful or um, basically floundered a bit in terms of uh, to what extent they established and persisted in these recreated or restored swords. So, the more recent schemes, um, Environmental Stewardship, which was launched in 2005, and the very new Countryside Stewardship, have been significantly built on this um, and, 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 and basically um, are built on this, this extensive evidence base. Uh, Higher-level stewardship, uh, is targeted at high value, has been targeted at high value features, whereas entry level stewardship is um, the kind of broad and shallow um, approach which has been widely taken up across the countryside. So um, there's a lot more flexibility and a lot more environmental, op uh, um, well, a lot more environmental ambition within these later schemes. 
So, what did all of this R&D reveal, really? Um, and I'm just focusing on the key conclusions because there's an awful lot of, uh, of evidence behind it. Um, the research has shown that sites vary very widely in their potential for restoration. And basically, sites, that, um, sites with soils exerting stress on plants, particularly via a low phosphorus status, have a higher potential for species-rich vegetation. And effectively, that's, that's down to uh, they're not being, then those, the target species not being competed out by uh, vigorous grasses. So, most important abiotic constraint is residual soil fertility. There's strong evidence that elevated P, soil P, limits restoration success. Um, and that we can readily overcome that by focusing restoration and recreation on sites with low soil P. We also know that um, successful restoration is often limited by an absence of seeds in the soil, in the soil seed bank, and or by um, a lack of them being able to disperse onto the site. So key biotic constraints are lack of seeds and uh, also suitable establishment sites within the sward. So is the sward dense and does not provide that, um, that openness? Um, actually, regen alone is unlikely to provide acceptable outcomes in most cases. And um, because of that, seed, adding seed through either green hay or oversowing is absolutely essential to basically um, overcome this. And before that happens, you actually need to open up the sward significantly by creating a good deal of disturbance using either cultivation side. Oops. Ah, that's it, sorry. Um, we also know that the management of, uh, subsequent management of the sward is really important. For example, and, that, and it can enhance the effectiveness of restoration and persistence of target species. So, for example, use of the, um, of the uh, grass uh, hemiparasite, yellow rattle, rhinanthus, is useful in reducing competition over a, a, over a period of time. And as I say, certain target wildfire species, while certain target wildfire species can establish and persist relatively easily, um, if we want the full range, of species that we find in semi-natural grasslands to thrive, um, competition has to be limited and opportunities for seed set and germ regeneration need to be provided in the long term. So how have, we, how have the findings from this research been synthesised to inform scheme design and options? Well, firstly, as I say, it's essential that we select those sites where, with the highest likelihood of success to help us deliver the desired outcomes and best value for money. And we do this by basically using the key criteria that have been identified by, um, by our research to inform um, decision support um, keys. And these are used by our advisors um, to basically assess on the ground you know, whether a site is suitable um, or not. Hmm. <laughs> Technical glitch. Um, so these are the keys that we uh, use basically to identify potential. And as you can see, you might not be able to see actually because it's rather small text, but um, basically having a soil test, soil nutrient status test, is, is key to um, informing that. So that's about targeting the right options to the right place. Um, getting the management right um, is effectively it's shown as that in order to achieve change within the lifetime of an agreement, i.e. less than 10 years, we need to um, basically reduce competition and create sufficient germination establishment opportunities. And I can't stress how enough, really, how important proactive and quite interventionist management is, is, um, is essential for um, shifting a grassland from something which is pretty boring to something which could be you know, quite close to a semi-natural grassland Within, um, within a 10-year period. So how do we do this? Well, um, typically, there's a, there, there'll be, in a, good, in a good agreement, there'll be a program of works specifying that first you power harrow to create a really good open seedbed, and then you um, effectively add seed in various ways, either through um, over-sowing or from the use of green hay. You can see um, green hay being spread, basically, on, a, on the site. And in terms of uh, setting indicators of success for restoration and establishment, um, for restoration and enhancement, well, it's important we have realistic um, outcomes. And this, uh, we, we set those by basically using the, uh, the, um, 
the plant trait, using the plant trait um, information we've got, which tells us which species are most likely to establish quickly, the competitive species like uh, oxide daisy, red clover, and you know, understanding which of, which species are a little bit harder to get in and, and might be might be um, might come in a bit later, provided um, competitions kept down, so time and um, some of the others. And that helps us to set indicators of success rather like this. So concluding remarks, well, the DEFRA R&D program has been independently reviewed and rated highly. It's benefited from a significant investment of cash since the 1990s. Um, and basically, recent schemes have benefited substantially from this improved evidence base. Um, and the value and contribution of this research is recognised in the conservation evidence synopses that Lynn's talked about and you know, that have been undertaken by Bill's Cambridge team. So evidence very much underpins the way grassland options are targeted, the management prescribed, and how realistic indicators of success are set. So we've got a great deal of good science which informs scheme design. Um, the question is now, how is this put into a practice and how effective is it delivered? And that's what Steve will be talking about. Thank you. So the big expenditure is um, uh, entry-level scheme. I wonder, do you think that's been cost-effective? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> no, not in all, not in all cases, no. And you know, the, the development of the new scheme, um, countryside stewardship has um, recognised that there's been an element of dead weight um, within the scheme, and it, that's a dead weight is a kind of technical policy term, which means you're not effectively getting value for money, you're paying for things that actually would have happened anyway. I mean, I would say that what we're talking about here in terms of our, our uh, grassland interventions is very much in the higher tier end of the spectrum, basically. So, um, and the you know, the, the, there is a very good evidence base behind, behind that. I mean, I don't know, Steve, if you want to chip in in terms of... Well, that's at the end of my talk. <laughs> and um, on that note, uh, I've been assured that Steve's talk is quite short, so uh, if there's any more questions you'd like to say for Steve and Claire after Steve, so I think we'll just crack on with that. Thank you very okay. much, Claire. So yeah, now we have part two. Uh, so Steve's going to continue telling us about grasslands. Thank you, Rose, and thank you to the BES uh, for um, paying for me to come to this meeting as uh, an impecunious young public servant. <laughs> uh, so yes, Claire has told you how the science shows that you can restore and recreate species-rich grassland. Does it work in practice? Does it work within agri-environment schemes? And the answer is, yes, it can. These are examples. Those pictures show uh, created or restored uh, species-rich grassland. And you can read all about that in that commissioned report 107, which came out a few years ago. Um, and it typically took 8 to 15 years. So within two agreement terms of 10-year agreements, uh, you can, um, if you get it right, you can do that. But, of course, these are just selected sites. Uh, what about the thousands of agri-environment agreements we've got out there, which are, of course, subject to the official monitoring programme? Uh, yes, I'm going to be just talking about environmental stewardship, the main scheme that ran for the 10 years from 2005, uh, and is still running, actually. And I'm going to be talking, because of the limit of time, I'm going to be just talking about the higher level scheme. Uh, environmental stewardship was, like the classic schemes, voluntary, 10-year agreements in the HLS. Of course, there were numerous rules, and of course, there was a requirement to reduce the administrative cost. In other words, the cost of people like Claire and me. Uh, but HLS was much more competitive than the preceding schemes and much more ambitious. 
and it sought to address the concerns over the quality of outcomes that we had in those schemes, including by having tighter eligibility criteria, a wider choice of prescriptions, almost all of which are editable, editable indicators of success, and most importantly, a planned programme of aftercare, including at least three visits within that 10-year agreement. And yes, that scheme was open until 2014, so the last agreements are not actually scheduled to expire until 2024. So there's still a lot to be gained from this scheme. There's over 100 options in the higher level. Divided into these groups, uh, you may or may not be able to see at the back that the grand total area covered by those options is about one and a half million hectares of England at a total expenditure of nearly 1.3 billion pounds. So we're talking substantial amounts of coverage and money here. Uh, not surprisingly, the biggest chunk of the uptake is on the moorlands, uh, but the grassland um, is there at over 300,000 hectares, with a spend there of 479 million pounds to which you can add most of that 96 million there because that is for supplements for either cattle grazing or rare breed grazing, most of which are attached to grassland options. So we're talking about well over half a billion pounds spend. Now that's a lot of public money. Uh, but it's essential if we're going to deliver across lowland England the Lawton vision of better, bigger and more core sites. So within those grassland options, we've got three groups, uh, and we're just going to be talking about the species-rich grassland, the priority habitat group of options. And here they are. Option HK6 is for maintenance of existing priority, priority habitat, which is in good condition. So you can see 34,000 hectares of that. HK7, the biggest most popular option. So that's for restoration of either existing priority habitat, which is not in good condition, or usually non-priority habitat grassland, but which has got high or moderate potential according to key 2C, one of those keys that you couldn't read that Claire showed up. Uh, so we've got 68,000 hectares of that. HK8 is for the creation of priority habitat from either an arable or a set-aside starting point, again defined by high or moderate potential in a key. We've got a much smaller amount of that, uh, only 5,000 hectares, mainly because we'd created so much arable reversion in our old schemes, we didn't think it was justified to target a lot more. And we hope that some of that old arable reversion uh, would be eligible for this option here. Uh, just to point out that the seed and green hay addition, which, as Claire pointed out, is so essential, uh, was funded uh, potentially by 100% uh, of, the, of the cost. Um, baseline monitoring has been done on HK8 and HK7, uh, and the HK7 uh, baseline sample showed that, yeah, a small proportion uh, of that sample was existing priority habitat in suboptimal condition, but most of it was semi improved. And interestingly, only 36% of the agreements actually specified seed introduction. So the results for HK8 are actually quite optimistic. Uh, after only five years in agreement, a third of that sample already met the threshold to qualify, this is the minimum threshold, uh, according to key 2A and 2B, uh, to, to qualify as priority habitat, of which um, about half of that was in good condition. And a further 30% met the threshold to qualify as semi-improved. So, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic, uh, and of course you can lose species as well as gain them, it's a bit like the stock market, uh, but, you know, with good management, uh, that ought to, you know, they've got off to a good start. Uh, but of course, that's the minority of the options in this group. The majority were in HK7, uh, and that was uh, resurveyed after eight years in agreement. So it's gone through most of its agreement term. And I'm afraid the results are nowhere near as optimistic. 
So only a quarter of that sample had actually improved in condition uh, and two-thirds had stayed in the same condition category and some of them had eaten. We're very disappointed by that, um, although it didn't come as a great surprise. Uh, we knew that a quarter of them had uh, a soil phosphorus level that was higher than we would have wanted uh, and uh, only 19% had actually received their addition of seed or green hay. Uh, now these of course were, this sample was of early agreements in HLS. The scheme was still bedding in, uh, advisors were not used to it obviously, uh, so yeah. We think that later um, agreements were probably somewhat better, but other projects have shown that the same sorts of issues uh, are still there. Uh, and a lot of these were um, identified back in 2010 in this big MESME project, which came up with these recommendations that agreements need to be better tailored to the site, we need better QA, including peer review, we need a national QA exercise of a sample, and we need better aftercare, regular visits essential, uh, some of which ought to be with a peer colleague. And more recent evidence has corroborated that. Um, quality, agreement quality and outcomes improved where there was regular contact and a commitment for continuity and only about a quarter of agreements had kept the same advisor and a quarter of agreements had had three or more advisors in that seven years. So that doesn't really represent good continuity. So the key messages. Uh, we've tried to uh, convince you that uh, the design of agro-environment uh, has a strong science base, at least in the higher level of the schemes. Uh, implementation, though, has proved very difficult, especially for the biodiversity outcomes. Uh, and to get those outcomes, you require well-informed land managers, trusted advisors, good QA and good aftercare. And we do have in Natural England a science advisory committee, uh, which Bill sits on, actually, uh, who are engaged with this. So my message to you, as I'm assuming mainly researchers and uh, scientists, you really need, if you want to understand the reasons for whether schemes are working or not, uh, you need to examine the detail of the way that they are delivered. Thank you. there is variation I think you're right you know I, we would we would acknowledge that but you know there is certainly there is good quality evidence that's been uh, that's been commissioned good quality R&D that's been commissioned on the uh, the bird options you know the activities for birds for um, moorland options I would say that there, there is variation in the depth and extensiveness of it but in general the quality of the evidence itself is good perhaps the amount of it is <laughs> is is, is, is I think grasslands did benefit most, but in some respects, you know, in terms of the um, in terms of the spend on grasslands, see, that's that's right and good because uh, grasslands form such a big component of the schemes in terms of the the take up and their prevalence in the landscape. So, so yeah, you know, it's not universally there's not universally extensive and in depth evidence underpinning everything. <laughs> I just wondered how it came about that if you, you obviously did have a good evidence base, and as a plant ecologist, I would agree with all the things that you said about these. You know, I don't think anyone would disagree with what with the evidence you presented in terms of this is what you need for success. So why was it then that a large amount of money was plowed into things that clearly were never going to be able to succeed because they didn't they didn't meet those criteria? And that just seemed extraordinary. Naively. 
It's a very good question. <laughs> uh, and of course, it's um, somewhat embarrassing, isn't it, really? Uh, you know, we're, well, <laughs> that, that, you know, that's why I'm the fall guy here. Um, we've known the reasons and we've said that we're correcting them, but we haven't actually effectively corrected them. You know, that's the truth of it. Uh, you know, the quality simply is not good enough on these key, most ambitious options. Remember that a lot of the options, you know, the hundred odd options, a lot of them are relatively straightforward to deliver. If you want to protect the historic archaeology, you simply have to stop plowing it up. You know, it's, it's not terribly difficult. <laughs> um, so a lot of things are fairly straightforward, but grassland in particular is very difficult, and yet there's so much of it, and the uptake is so high, it is critical to get it right. We're talking about Natural England advisors here. Yeah. Hi, yeah, um, so I'm still quite interested about this kind of central point, which was about the percentage of schemes which were actually ineffective. So they weren't working, you know, when they were delivered. And obviously we've seen that, you know, there's delivery problems and all the rest of it. Um, but according to your assessment, what percentage of the schemes, because obviously nothing's always going to be effective, but according to your assessment, what percentage of the schemes are ineffective and how does that compare to the original point that was made? like the original claim of how yeah, what percentage yeah. were ineffective. Well, I don't know how Bill actually did his <laughs> Bill didn't well, describe how he did his stop. original <laughs> estimate. <laughs> it, was, it was presented as a guess, wasn't it? No, no, it was, uh, it's from a meta-analysis published in Conservation Biology of all the studies across Europe, which, which gave the evidence for effectiveness and showed that uh, effectiveness hadn't improved over time. Well, we haven't worked it out across the scheme, no, not in the same quantified way. I'm sorry, uh, this is really interesting, but I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, finish it here. <laughs> so hopefully these guys will be around uh, for the discussion over lunch. Um, but thanks very much. Yes, you're free to buy us lunch, you know. <laughs>
any landowners that are participating in agri-environment schemes can cut their hedgerows more than once every two years. And since 2015, we've had an additional policy in place where farmers can apply to cut their hedgerows during the month of August, um, but it's restricted to certain crop types and you need specific written permission. So a problem that has been had with hedgerow management policies is they have been lobbied for a long time by a number of um, unions and, so, apologies for getting a bit parochial, but specifically in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Farmers Union has for decades lobbied to have the close cutting period changed. We've always had the long close cutting period. Um, and what that led to was the Ulster Farmers Union, which is the biggest farmers union in Northern Ireland, and the RSPB, which are the biggest conservation NGO in Northern Ireland, um, completely fell out of it. And the UFU demanded that all their members withdrew all support from the RSPB. So the conservation potential there was also quite serious. So we wanted to look into this further from a social point of view rather than just from an ecological point of view. So the first question we asked was, was how do attitudes towards conservation interact with attitudes towards the close cutting period? We hear a lot from unions that jumping up and down saying they want the close cutting period changed, but if you go out and ask Joe Farmer, do they actually really want this changed? And then finally we thought we'd ask just to try and assess what level of knowledge there was of this policy among the rural community. So I did a questionnaire survey at the largest agricultural show in Ireland. I had a number of lovely volunteers that I paid in chocolate fish and I'm still eternally grateful for their time. It's not easy work at all. And they went round with their clipboards and they asked um, people at the show, both farmers and non-farmers, um, their personal demography, if they had a farm, more details of their farm, what attitudes they had towards conservation, what opinions they had on agricultural policy, and what knowledge they had of hedgerow policy. So our show was based around here, but really we got a good spread of respondents from across the province. And we got 300 respondents, half of which lived, owned, or worked on a farm that had hedgerows. So I would say that they probably should know what hedgerow policies are. And our first question, um, how do these attitudes interact? You, I looked for latent structures within these data using PCA. And just to give you the first two factors from this, our first factor, which I named conservation interest, moves from people who wanted to abolish the close cutting period and feel that policy interferes with what they do and it's a waste of time, in negative, through to people who thought conservation was important and that they were included in policy decisions. And on this scale, we find that those that were over 50 had significantly higher scores on this scale. And people who had larger farms had significantly lower scores on this scale. And our second factor, which I named policy reform, moves from people who want to protect the current close cutting period in the negative through to people who want to shorten the close cutting period. And on this scale, we find that people who had hedgerows removed we're significantly more likely to have a higher scoring on this scale. So the second question we asked is, do you actually want the policy changed? So we had three attitudinal statements. Do you think the close cutting period should be protected? Should it be shortened? Should it be abolished? And what we found was that in both farmers and non-farmers, um, sorry, just if that scale is too small, purple is agree and pinky red is disagree, that in both cohorts, there was a strong level of support for the current full close cutting period which is contrary to what one may hear if one speaks to farmers' unions. Sometimes, apologies if there are any union people in the room, but come chat to me later. Um, in terms of shortening the close cutting period, there was sort of, I think it's fair to say, it's neutrality among farmers and among non-farmers. They did not want any shortening. And then when we asked people, do you want it abolished? People did not want it abolished. That wasn't something people thought was, should be an option. So thirdly, we wanted to know, do they actually know what the policy is? So we asked, can you, this, this was only asked to people who cheers, had hedgerows, do you know what the starting month of the close product period is? So the starting month is March, so a lot of people got March, but a lot of people did not. And then we asked again, do you know when the ending month of the close cutting period is? And a lot of people got August, which is the correct answer, but even more people did not know. And in the end, this is a people who have hedgerows on their farm, 75% of people did not know when both the start and end date of the close cutting period was, and 25% of people knew. 
and I think that's shocking. It's such a simple piece of policy. Maybe I am a young, naive ecologist, but this is not what I thought was going to happen. And if it's something as simple as close cutting dates, it kind of makes you start to worry. Um, else is misunderstood, and we have, we know that not all the policies, conservation policies in agriculture are working, and could a contributing factor be that maybe people don't know what's happening, possibly? Um, so when we look at this in terms of social action theory, and while I'm apologising to groups of people, if there's any actual sociologists in the room, also come talk to me afterwards, because it's quite new to me. Um, we know that so, like, action is made up of two principles, the motivation to act, in addition to the ability to act. And this cohort, they have the motivation to act, they have a strong support that they feel that this policy should be in place and they don't want it to be changed. But they have a lack of knowledge which impairs their ability to act. And can we really say, without going out to every farm, that these, le this legislation is being adhered to? And I think something we need to think about here definitely is modes of communication. So as it stands today, most modes of communication in terms of hedgerow policy, you can start with cap agreements. So in the pile of papers that any landowner who's adhering to single farm payments gets, there's a paragraph saying, this is what you should do about hedgerows, but it's a lot of information to take in at one time. So I would argue that there are some problems there. Farm inspections, again, to get a bit parochial, I worked out in Northern Ireland that your chances of having your farm inspected is once every hundred years. And about two weeks after I worked that out, the, there was an announcement from our Minister of Agriculture that they had to cut funds to farm inspections. So I don't really think that's working. And mass media, like um, all the farmers' weeklies, as well as national papers, when the close cuttings period starts and when it ends, there are newspaper articles. So I couldn't tell you why that's not working, but I think it's fair to say it isn't. And I've been reading a lot about it, and there's a really cool paper by Hall and Rhodes, Every time I practice this talk, I accidentally said Holland Oats, Holland Roads from 2010. And what they found, they did sort of similar work, but it was with um, organic farmers in the States. And they found that subjective norms, so the own pressure that you feel within your own little ecosystem from community, family, and consumers, were far more likely to shape farmers' actions. And secondary to that, interpersonal communications such as workshops and meetings and demonstrations, were the most effective mode of communication from a body of authority to farmers. So just in conclusion, we are, from our work, it seems that older farmers and smaller holdings have a greater connection to nature conservation, which is worrying because older farmers are getting older and all our farms are getting bigger, so we really don't want to lose that. Um, the closed cutting period seems to be supported both by farmers and by lay people, which is great. But the downside is that there is a severe lack of knowledge, um, specifically among the people who should be living this. Um, so, yeah, I had a lot, of, a lot of lovely people with a lot of lovely clipboards help me, and I'm very grateful. And um, thank you all for listening. Questions? Um, if you're near the microphone, uh, lay the long hair. Could you uh, use it? Maybe? So you say that it's the older generation that have the closer connection to conservation, but I wonder what the age structure of knowledge is. Is there a link with yeah. education, for example? I guess you could say the longer you've been in the game, the more you've been told what the close cutting period is. Yeah. Is an option, but. but I mean, like university level education, are many younger farmers oh, going through okay. training at a higher level? Does this have any correlation with the results? It's not something we actually looked at, but. You make a very good point, and hindsight is 2020. <laughs> that would have been a good thing to look at, definitely, yeah. What's the level of uh, failure to abide by the regulations? Is it just that uh, perhaps a lot of people may not know exactly when the cutting period legally is, mm -hmm. but they always do it in September, October, so it's never a problem? That's just, so, DERA, the agricultural... Um, government body in Northern Ireland, I've repeatedly asked them how many reports have you got of be, the close cutting period being broken, and they insist it's 30 a year. But I get a lot more than 30 emails a year from people who think I can do something about it, telling me that their neighbours 
um, cutting their hedges in the middle of summer. So I think really there is a severe lack of monitoring, definitely. And the knowledge, it would be great to know what rates of breaking it there is, but the information's just never been collected. I just wondered if you had any plans for how you're going to get your research out to the people who need to know it, because it seems really fascinating to me that the unions are saying that farmers, um, d you know, want a shorter yeah. plus cutting period, but your research yeah. clearly shows that that's not the case, and also mm -hmm. that they don't know when, how long the cutting period is anyway. So if they think it's January to October, then yeah, maybe they do want a shorter cutting period, yeah. like maybe, you know, March to August or something. Um, how are you gonna How are you gonna get that information how, out there? Yeah, so I do a lot more community talks than I do conference talks, mm -hmm. and try and get around and tell people I should probably write a paper. My supervisor's not here, but I'm definitely on that. <laughs> um, and I've been funded by the Department of Agriculture, or they've changed the name, Department of Environment and Rural Affairs, um, and they are quite good at getting you to meet, like I've sat down and showed this to the officials who write this policy, but making people listen is a different story, but I'm fine. Um, I've got one. Mm -hmm. uh, is it all the same themselves who are doing the hedge management or do they use contractors? It's not, no, that's something that I didn't think the presentation we did ask. So I had kind of assumed before I did it that contractors would be the most common. But we asked, do you cut your hedges yourself? Do neighbours do it for you? Or do you get contractors? And contractors was actually the least frequent mode of cutting hedges. Most people got their neighbours to do it, which I guess would suggest maybe they didn't necessarily have to know everything. And then they do it themselves and then they use contractors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. speaker is Lauriane Rosé, who is from CNRS, that's the, the French Centre for National Research. Okay, thanks. So, um, hello. So, I will speak about the um, agricultural public policies and uh, try to understand the differences or the synergies between two objectives, so the green and the sustainable, sustainable ones. So, what is the con the context of the studies, it's the um, agriculture in France after the Second World War. So um, due to the common agricultural policies, we had um, two-speed agriculture with a large incentive and quite rich farms and uh, small and poor, more poor um, farms, uh, which, uh, and this two-speed uh, agriculture uh, yield some um, social issues. And in addition to that, we have um, the classical negative impacts of the intensification of agriculture. So for this reason, uh, the second pillar, uh, a second pillar has been implemented in the um, common agricultural policies. And the objective of this second pillar is to um, implement a um, sustainable perspective within the, these economic policies. And more recently, uh, we can uh, we can find a lot of critics about the effectiveness of this second pillar, especially um, about the um, non-effectiveness uh, effectiv uh, in terms of um, ecological perspectives. And uh, there is an ongoing debate about how to green the cap. So the question of this of this paper is to investigate. Um, I mean, it is to investigate this debate uh, and uh, more especially the difference between the green and sustainable objectives within an economic um, policies. Because initially, the cap is an economic, po uh, is an economic uh, policy. So it's important to keep in mind that um, all these policies are designed in an economic perspective first. So they try to um, insert uh, sustainable or green objectives, but the main uh, goal is an economic um, perspective. So for that, we um, we, we we use um, uh, bioeconomic models, and uh, this model. 
Yeah, in this model we have a public policy part and um, it's a public policy scenarios, scenario uh, designed by a national uh, public decision maker under different kind of constraints, so for example the budgetary constraints, but also ecolo ecological or economic, soci socio-economic constraints. And then this national public uh, policy scenarios is received by a lot of farmers, so here it's uh, standard regional farmers, and uh, according to that and according to uh, their um, economic uh, function and program, they decide which kind of agricultural systems they want to implement uh, next year. And this kind of agricultural systems will impact the quality of the environment, the habitat, for example, and then will uh, play on the biodiversity. Here we use bird, um, bird, bird abundances. Then we can uh, assess the performances of the systems according to economic and eco ecological indicators, and these indicators are used um, to design the public policy uh, scenarios according to the objectives of the um, decision maker. So this is the main um, schemes. So I will develop some um, quickly some equations, but really quickly, just to give you uh, an idea about which kind of model we, we use. So for the ecological part, so we model the abundance of the species S in the region R at T plus one, which is a function of the same abundance uh, at time T. And it also depends on the gross parameter and um, it depends on a um, variable of environmental quality. And what is interesting here is that this carrying capacity parameter is depending on the land uses dedicated to the, dif uh, the sorry, the proportion of the utility area dedicated to the different land uses. So here it's a linear, uh, linear relationships, but uh, we can investigate different ones. And uh, so the coefficient beta and alpha are the species uh, coef the, um, so yeah the species coefficient. So if alpha is strongly positive, this means that the 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 species S has a, a high positive response to the a specific land uses. If alpha is negative, this means that this land uses is quite uh, detrim de detrimental. I mean, not positive for the species S. Um, and then we had um, uh, stochastic uncertainty. So then we have a lot of uh, information about different species uh, and we have information uh, related to abundances so we can compute different kind of indicators. And here, for example, I use the farmland bird index, which is the classical index uh, of um, agricultural biodiversity. And then we, we, we join this um, ecological model to an economic, uh, an, an economic model. So um, maybe it's not really classical for you, but it's, it's a really classical framework of economic uh, models. And um, each um, standard farmer it's, is represented by a utility function. This utility function is a, a mean variance um, uh, function. Uh, based on the income, so A is a risk aversion coefficient. So it's really classical, actually. The income uh, is depending on the gross margins dedicated to each land uses, uh, the proportions dedicated to the land, land uses, and it, de it depends also on the public incentive. So if TO is positive, this means that uh, the specific land uses had uh, subsidies. If TO is negative, this means that the land use is uh, taxed. Uh, and then, uh, what is the program? So it's a classical economic program. So it's an optimization program. And the objective is to uh, find the optimal uh, portfolio, so the optimal um, uh, proportions dedicated to the to the all land uses in order to in order to, by, by maximizing the utility function under two constraints. The first constraint, it's a classical constraint to limit the speed of change. So this means that between two, consequent, consequent, between, between two years, it's not possible to change all the um, superficie. There is a, a small amount of, um, of uh, area. And the second one, it's a easier, 
constraint. This means that the total agricultural area remains constant um, across time. Um, then we had so uh, the public policy part. So we have different kind of scenarios. So the scenario laissez faire, which means that there, there is no there is no uh, additional um, subsidies or taxes. So two is equal to zero for all the land uses. And then we have the two uh, scenarios we would like to investigate. So the first one is the green scenario. So it's um, an economic perspective. So the, how this kind of scenario or design is designed by maximizing the richness. So the objective is to find the optimal tool, uh, so combination of taxes and subsidies, in order to maximize the richness under two constraints. The first one is a budgetary constraint, and the second one is a, it's an ecological constraint. So how this uh, constraint is um, computed? So we, the objective, um, so, for example, if, if mu is equal to uh, 10%, this means that the ecological um, indicators has to be higher than at least 10% uh, compared to the performance obtained with the laissez-faire scenario. So we have to increase the, performance, the ecological performance at least of 10%. So we, of course, we will uh, try different, value or different values of, um, of uh, mu. So if mu is 1%, it's not really restrictive. If mu, if mu is uh, 50%, it's uh, definitely more, more restrictive. And then the sustainable scenario, so it's the same tractor, but in addition to the biological uh, constraints, we had a poor constraints so this poor indicator is uh, based on the, uh, the, 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 the poor uh, region. So, uh, so we, have, um, we, we, we find the poorest region in France, and we want to ensure that this poorest region has at least a best performance than the, its uh, performance with the laissez-faire scenario. Uh, so then, uh, very quickly, we, uh, this, uh, this uh, model is based on data, of course, so we calibrated the, the economic and the ecological uh, models based on different kind, kind, kind of data. So bird biodiversity, as I said, and uh, agricultural ones. So I don't have any time to, to develop it. Just to show you the, um, some um, results of the calibration. So here it's, for example, for the specialist species and for the general species, the fit between the theoretical abundances and the predicted abundances by the model. So it's quite, um, okay. it's quite uh, satisfying. Uh, and then some example of different uh, birds. So what, what about the, the results? So here it's the main um, graph. So it's about the uh, optimal green and sustainable scenarios. So here we have the public policy cr criteria, which is the richness, the overall richness, and here the level of the constraints. So it's mu, for example. So here we have mu equal to 1%, of, uh, 2%, percent etc. So um, here we can observe that, oh, first we can observe that when we increase the constraints, uh, the richness decrease. This means that uh, it's classical, but there is a trade-off between the economic uh, objectives and the social and ecological um, objectives. So this is classical. But what is interesting is that for the smallest value of constraints, we have the same uh, scenarios um, if we consider the green perspective or the sustainable perspective. It's the same also for the highest level of constraints. But for the intermediate value of constraints, we can observe that we, can, we have different uh, optimal scenarios. And what is interesting is that uh, the green scenarios are less costly than the sustainable ones. And you, the, 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 yeah, the last is smaller for the green scenarios compared to the sustainable, sustainable scenarios. So what is behind uh, this result? So first, we would like to uh, investigate the um, social um, constraints. The social constraints, so we can see that 
um, the social concern can be uh, obtained with uh, positive incentives on grasslands. So it's, we can increase the social constraints if we increase the subsidy on grassland. Then um, the biodiversity target, so it's the green policies, we can uh, achieve this goal uh, either by putting some subsidies on grasslands. So if we uh, increase the if we increase the subsidy on grassland, we can achieve better ecological um, performance. But it, it's also uh, possible to achieve this uh, ecological performance by uh, reduce, reducing the current incentive on croplands. So here it's like a tax on croplands, but in the, our context, it's about reducing the, the, incentive, the current incentive on um, subsidies on croplands. And what is interesting is that it's possible uh, for the smallest level of ecological uh, objectives, but after um, a threshold, uh, even if we uh, increase these um, taxes, it's not possible to increase the ecological performance. There is a, a, a yeah, stop. And it's because of that that we have um, these interesting results. Because here, so we can see the richness for the two kind of uh, uh, incentives. So for the uh, smaller, smaller level, smallest level, we have um, the most interesting uh, policies are based on uh, grasslands uh, incentives. After a, a, a certain threshold, it's, not, it's possible to achieve this kind of ecological uh, performance just with uh, grasslands. But here is interesting because. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, it's uh, uh, with a uh, smallest level of uh, taxes, uh, we can play on specific regions, and just by playing on this specific region, we can increase the um, overall uh, ecological performance. So it's a reason why it's less costly, because just by, uh, by acting on specific region, we can uh, have uh, yeah, a global uh, performance. So just quickly um, about the, the discuss discussion. So there is uh, some uh, theoretical conclusions. It's about that it's possible to integrate and improve simultaneously social and ecological perspective uh, with uh, public economic policies. And what is interesting for the CAP and the ongoing debates about how to green CAP is that if we want to green the CAP, then actually play on the first pillar, uh, meaning uh, reducing the current uh, subsidies on crop is the um, is the most uh, efficient way to um, is the less cost costly way to improve the ecological performance. But if the objective is to uh, is more the sustainable development, then the only way to achieve this objective is to play on the second pillar, meaning uh, adding, um, for example, uh, subsidies on extensive grassland. So actually about the current debout, debate, everybody is right. If we want to um, have a sustainable point of view, we, we need this second pillar. But if we want to green, just green the cap, then of course maybe uh, just play on the first pillar will be the most economic, uh, if it, efficient way. Thanks. Sorry. That was really interesting, but I'm afraid we have no time for questions, okay. so you might have to get Lorianne over lunch, um, if you have any. Right, so next up we have, um, So we have Gagana Daskaleva and from the University of Edinburgh, and she's going to talk to us about birds. Hi, I'll be presenting the results of my undergraduate thesis, which examined how long-term agroenvironment management impacts farmland birds in northeastern Scotland, an area dominated by low-intensity farming. And I've been fortunate to be collaborating with Dr. Ali Fillimore from the University of Edinburgh, where I'm based as well, and Dr. Alan Perkins from the RSPB. So here you can see DEFRA's bird index again. And uh, in, uh, in red, you can see the decline of farmland birds. It's interesting to note that the first farmland conservation measures were implemented around 1986. Even though the rate of decline has since slowed down, today, 30 years later, we're still far from reversing it. 
As we've heard from talks today, the main conservation tool put in place has been agri-environment schemes, to which I refer as AES. Through AES, farmers receive payments which act as incentive to engage in conservation. The schemes are voluntary and farmers have a range of options to choose from, such as uh, planting overwintering crops to supplement winter bird diet, maintaining field margins to boost invertebrate diversity, and delaying grass cutting so that ground nesting birds have enough time to rear their broods. The schemes have been the subject of hundreds of evaluations which have revealed that not only does AES effect vary between species, but also within the species range. This brings forward the importance of landscape context in evaluating how the schemes are performing. So to get a comprehensive idea of AES effect, we need to examine them across the full range of land use intensity gradient in the UK. And currently, low intensity farmland has received much less attention compared to high intensity farmland in England, as we've heard from previous talks. And so we set out to examine low intensity farming, so that's a regional study, with the hope that studies like ours together can build up an understanding of uh, overall AES benefit and a contribution to meeting national and global biodiversity goals. We addressed the following research questions. What are the population trends of farmland birds in northeastern Scotland between 2003 and 2015? And how do agro-environment schemes in low-intensity farmland impact bird abundance? So our study species were tree sparrow, skylark, linnet, yellowhammer, and reed bunting. And there were also data available on corn buntings, which has been analyzed in Perkins South 2011 and will be revisited in a report by the Scottish Natural Heritage coming out in January next year. But back to our five uh, species. So in the last 20 years, according to BBS trends, uh, some of them in the UK have increased, others have decreased, so that's the black bars here. But it's interesting to note that in Scotland, the gray bars all four species for which data were available have increased. So our study sites represented 53 farms in northeastern Scotland with control farms here in blue and scheme farms in red. So these were real life farms. So during the study period, some of them changed treatment. So for instance, a scheme farm would become a control farm or vice versa, which was accounted for in statistical analysis. Overall though, 43 were AES and 26 were control for at least three years. And the schemes that operated on these farms were first, the Farmland Bird Lifeline, which was operated by the RSPB and is an example of a targeted scheme focusing on core buntings, which also offered farmers ex expert advice in the hopes of encouraging adaptive management. The second scheme, Rural Stewardship Scheme, was run by the Scottish Government, and that's a broad scheme, not focusing on any particular species, which offered farmers a lot of choice in terms of what they could do. And finally, Rural Priorities, again coming from the Scottish Government, didn't focus on a particular species, but did have some options targeted at core buntings. In general, though, the scheme offered farmers less choice in terms of on the ground management they could implement. So to study the effects of these three schemes, we used the following field methodology. A survey route was designed to pass along 250 meters of each point on the farm, and survey effort increased proportionately with farm size. The surveys were conducted in 2003, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 15, and the data collected represented count abundance um, data. So for instance, uh, a pair of uh, breeding reed buntings or uh, one uh, um, breeding male of yellowhammers. And at this point, I would like to thank the RSPB for conducting the surveys, the Scottish Natural Heritage for um, funding them, as well as the field workers and the landowners for granting us access. So to address our research questions, we used hierarchy of Bayesian models, and we chose our model variables a priori based on their ecological significance. In our models, we included abundance as the response variable. We added treatment type, whoops, um, AES versus control, as an explanatory categorical variable, and we included area to account for differences in farm size, longitude and latitude to reduce the spatial signal, visits 
to account for differences in survey effort. And finally, we added random effects, farm and year, to account for the non-independence of data points. <coughs> so, after we addressed our first research question, we found that between 2003 and 2015, two species, linnet and skylark, have decreased in abundance, reed buntings have remained relatively stable, and tree sparrows and yellow hammers have increased in abundance. And the values you see here are based on model predictions for an average farm, with the error bars showing 95% credible intervals. And we found no perceivable difference in population trends based on treatment type. So as you can see from the graphs, the population trends do mirror each other quite well on both treatment types. These results were then confirmed by our investigation of uh, how agri-environmental schemes affect the birds in general. So here you can see a graph of model predictions for bird abundance for each species. And once again, we didn't detect any significant difference in breeding bird abundance based on treatment type. So our results could be explained by a combination of factors, the first being that in northeastern Scotland, you still get a relatively intact and diverse um, landscape matrix. And secondly, there's the possibility of dispersal from AES farms into the wider landscape, which I will discuss in more detail later. And as we've heard from previous talks today, the um, attitude of farmers towards schemes can have a really big impact on how well the farmers are implementing them and whether they actually engage with the conservation aspect of the schemes. So now going into more detail in dispersal, from our map here you can see that control and AES farms are quite close to one, one another, which is what you would want to minimize differences in environmental conditions. But this also means that due to sourcing dynamics, it's possible that individuals from control farms or individuals from AES farms are moving into control farms. And so AES farms could be feeding control farms with individuals, effectively making the abundances on the two treatment types appear similar. And we have data for corn buntings, and so you can see that corn buntings do move a lot between the different farm types, going as far as 15 kilometers. So to have an effective AIS evaluation, we think that future studies should account for bird <coughs> movement. And also, there's the possibility of displacement due to rank. So for instance, um, yellow hammers, uh, with yellow hammers, higher ranked males could um, force lower rank males to use suboptimal habitats. In our case, that would be control farms. And finally, our data were collected during the breeding season, so we didn't examine what happens during the winter. And it's possible that control birds during the winter might be migrating and benefiting from AES options, such as leaving overwintering um, like crops but then the control birds would return to their breeding territories on AES farms. And so we think that there's the possibility of AES benefit spanning further out than just the area of the farm. And it could be that agro-environment schemes are alleviating winter mortality in general across the landscape. So w these results are part of an ongoing investigation and uh, to test um, dispersal and issues of uh, distances between farms, we will be using spatial generalized linear mixed effects models to examine how distance between farms influences similarities in abundance. And we're also conducting a power analysis to determine what's the appropriate sample size to detect AES effects in low intensity farmland. So the implications of our results can um, relate to the importance of accounting for landscape matrix in how you design a scheme. So for instance, in England, for, uh, in uh, high intensity landscapes, if you bring in a small improvement, perhaps planting a hedge, a hedgerow, that would have a comparatively big effect. In high intensity, uh, in low intensity landscapes though, such as the ones that we examined, if you bring in a small improvement, that will have a small effect or an effect that's harder to detect. This brings forward the idea of additionality. Additionality refers to um, whether any conservation measures you implement are actually bringing something new into the ecosystem. And our results suggest that in agro-environmental schemes, in northeastern Scotland at least, 
there might be a lack of AES additionality. And additionality also directly relates to cost effectiveness. So perhaps AES design needs to be, we need to rethink it and uh, maybe there's other species that should be the priority. For example, in Scotland, that would be waders. And we do need to make sure that any change that happens thanks to the AES schemes is additional to what would have happened otherwise. So in conclusion, we found that two species, tree sparrow and yellow hammer, have increased in abundance, but we didn't detect any significant variation in abundance based on treatment type. And our results suggest that at least in low intensity farmland, there is a lack of AES additionality, which might be imp impeding conservation effectiveness. Thank you. And uh, yeah, do find me afterwards. I'm very happy to talk about agro-environmental schemes. I've been thinking a lot about this issue in the sense of uh, now with the greening of the cap and, uh, and set aside land and also with more and more farmers signing up for the schemes. So in five years, what are we going to be comparing AES farms with? So even within our study period, we found that control farms are gradually disappearing. So I do think that the simple comparison of AES versus control has, it needs to go into more detail. So something that I'm really keen to do in the future would be to look at the specific land management options, the landscape context, and also like, what, is, what, is the, what is the option from all the ones available that is the most cost effective. So that's where we should target our funding. So I think uh, for skylarks, it, uh, it relates a lot to weather. So in 2009, it was a really hard winter for skylarks. So the uh, weather patterns would be one, uh, one thing. And, uh, and then also, I, th I would say that it's a lot of complex interactions. So for instance, hedgerows might be bringing benefits in terms of providing ne a nesting habitat, but they might also be acting as predation traps. And so I think that the schemes do have an effect that's like really hard to detect, a small effect that's interacting with lots of other things. So it'd be really hard to pinpoint what's the one thing that's driving the population trend. Thanks, Thanks Ugana. I think we'll just have to Great, and uh, our final speaker um, is Helen Hicks, who's going to talk to us about evolution in ecological timescales. Okay, last slot before lunch. You can get your sandwiches shortly, but bear with me for 10 minutes. Um, right, okay, I'm normally good at wandering when I do presentations. I will try and tie myself to the podium. Um, I'm going to talk to you about evolution in ecological timescales. I have purposely not told you what I'm going to be talking about, and you will find out in two slides' time. Okay, um, so we tend to think that evolution is something that happens in uh, very long timescales. I'm going to tell you today... Um, about how they happen in ecological, much shorter-term timescales, and how that's a massive threat to our food security um, and food production. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, resistance. Okay, so this is just repeated use of chemicals um, and evolution of resistance. Why? Because it's a massive threat to food production systems. Okay, so one example um, of evolved resistance is superbugs. So I'm, all, I'm sure you've all heard 
I'm wondering. I'm sure you've all heard of antibiotic resistance. So in Europe, uh, antibiotic resistance is uh, the cause of 25,000 deaths a year. It's 2.5 million extra hospital days in a year and 1.5 billion euros. So superbugs and antibiotic resistance is a massive cost. What I'm actually going to talk to you today is super weeds. Okay, I'm repeatedly told that weed science is boring and not sexy, so I'm going to tra try and change your minds and enthuse you all about weeds before lunch, okay? Um, okay, so this is all about herbicide resistance. Um, herbicide resistance isn't a new thing. It first um, was discovered in the 1950s. Uh, there are 250 species worldwide which are resistant to herbicides, weed species, and just over half of these um, are actually resistant to multiple different modes of action. Um, I'll talk about modes of action um, as we go through the talk. It's just different ways that different herbicides work, um, so different mechanisms for killing the weeds. Okay. All righty. So... Um, Farmers like to use herbicides because they're very good at what they do if they're not evolved resistance to. They're very cheap to apply and it's very easy for a farmer to sit on his tractor and go up and down his field. That is why herbicides and pesticides are the number one go-to tool for farmers using um, in crop protection. Um, the dark side of using herbicides is that we get this rapid evolution of um, herbicide resistance, and this is because we are exerting a constant selective pressure, okay? Um, so I'm just going to show you some quick images to demonstrate that. So this is your, uh, your field with your weeds in it. The green one here um, represents your resistant weed in your field, okay? So you spray your herbicide, the resistant plant resi um, survives and sets seed. So the next time... Um, you have lots more weeds with m more resistance in the population, and if you apply that herbicide again, eventually you get the majority of plants, the majority of weeds in your field are resistant um, to your herbicide that you sprayed. Um, with that in mind, you'd hope that we wouldn't see this trend because this, qu this is quite dangerous. This is just a graph showing you um, the total herbicide applications in Great Britain, and you can see that from 1990 to 2015, the total area that has been treated with herbicides has nearly doubled. Okay? So in ecological terms and in terms of ev evolved resistance, I think this is quite a dangerous game that we're playing. All right, so today I'm going to focus on this project, which is the Blackgrass Resistance Initiative. EGRI. So black grass here is the villain of my story. It grows to about this high, so about 80 centimetres a metre high. It grows above crops. This is actually a wheat field that I'm showing you a picture of, okay? You can't really tell it's a wheat field because it's massively infested with black grass. Um, so black grass is very highly fecund. It has up to 2,000 seeds per plant because it has lots of tillers. Um, it also sheds, sheds its seed just before harvest, and so when farmers are going in with their combine harvesters, they're spreading the seed everywhere. Um, in 1989, this was the ninth mo most frequent weed in the UK, and now it is very much the first, the very top of the list, the most frequent weed in the UK. And it's the number one agronomic issue, if you ask most farmers at the moment. So, it's a big issue, and there are lots of ways that farmers are actually trying to uh, manage their blackgrass populations and also manage resistance. Um, the problem is, is that although we know it's a big issue and farmers are told there are lots of ways to manage it, all of the evidence for the efficiency of these different ways of managing is actually quite piecemeal and done in very small-scale plots in farming trials. So there's a big lack of a uh, big data set that covers the whole country, okay? And that's what I'm going to show, show to you today. Okay, um, so the key questions are, what's the extent of the problem? How many weeds are uh, out there? So how much black grass is there out there? Um, are they resistant to herbicides? What's driving these populations? Um, is it resistance? Okay, and does field management history and the different approaches that farmers have had to managing their fields have an effect on the levels of resistance? Have they, tried, have they managed to avoid resistance evolving? Um, and what are the implications for farm businesses and food security? Okay, so I told you that there was a lack of a big data set, so this is what I'm going to present today. We've done this study across nearly 140 fields on over 70 farms across 11 counties. So this, 
This map here will show you um, basically the lowland arable areas of the UK because it's primarily an arable weed. Okay. Um, so we've collected a lot of data on these farms. Um, so for each field, we've on the left you can see this is a heat map. Okay, this is we've gone out and mapped the density of the weeds in these fields. Okay, so the dark red squares represent where there's a lot of these weeds. So they're very high densities, and then the paler squares are where it's absent or low densities. Okay, for each of these fields, we've collected seeds and we've tested them um, with three different herbicides with three different modes of action. Okay. Um, so the seeds were collected in random places throughout the field um, and then bulked, so we've got a random population from within the field. We've then got a hell of a lot of management data and herbicide data for each of these fields, which actually getting this data out of farmers is like getting blood out of a stone. So this is like my achievement over the last two years. Um, so we've got um, data on cultivation type, crop rotation, and herbicide applications. And this comes into play when I talk a little bit about um, the different strategies for managing blackgrass and resistance. And then um, for a smaller subset of fields, because not all farmers have the clever technology for mapping their yields, we have yield maps so we can directly compare um, blackgrass densities with the yields that the farmers are getting out of the fields. Okay. Okay, key question number one is what's the extent of the problem and how many weeds are there out there? Um, so there are some fields that are absolutely rife with black grass. So you can see on this image behind me, this is a very red map. So this is very high densities across the field. Um, and you can see that there are some fields that have low patchy densities. Um, so you can see there's variation in black grass density between fields. You can also see, if you look at these little pie charts, which you might not be able to see from the back, that this varies nationally, okay? In the south, in Buckinghamshire, it's a massive problem. There's a lot of high and very high densities of black grass, um, whereas in Yorkshire, there's a lot of um, the squares that we surveyed are actually absent or low densities of black grass. Um, this is just exemplified on this graph here, so I can't actually move from the microphone. This is the south, and this is high densities of black grass. This is the north, and these are lower densities of black grass, okay? And you can just see that in the image on uh, the map as well. And this is actually, it, there's a historical spread as well. So these are different colors. Um, but you can see that actually, I can't, I can't be tied with this. The black grass was originally here and it's now moving up to these areas here. So there's an element of, are we looking for causation? Is resistance causing the black grass to spread? Okay, I'm whizzing through these now. Quiz, <laughs> question number two. Um, what's, dri what's driving these populations? So are they resistant? So um, the answer is yes. A lot of the populations were resistant. It varies between the different herbicides that we've tested. You can see that most of the dots on this graph, I failed to put the axis on it. Um, the bottom axis on that graph is the densities of black grass. Okay? We've just transferred it into numerical measure of density because we've averaged it across the whole field. So four is very high density across the whole board, and zero is very low density or absent across the board, okay? Um, so you can see that for Atlantis, the majority of populations, whether it's low or high densities, are actually resistant to black grass, but there is still a positive relationship between density and resistance, okay? It's the same for phenoxyprop, apart from even more of the populations are resistant, and cycloxidum, there's slightly more variation, but there's still a positive correlation between resistance and density, okay? So this is no surprise. We find that resistance is actually driving these high population densities that we see. Okay, so does man field management history affect the levels of resistance? This is kind of getting to the crux of what we wanted to answer. Um, so typical kind of theory is that if you alter, alter your different herbicides that you're applying and you vary your mo modes of action, by cycling or mixing your herbicides, you will avoid evolution of resistance, okay? So we looked at the herbicide re regimes that farmers are using. So we looked at number of applications, which is um, herbicide intensity, and we looked at number of modes of action, which is herbicide diversity, okay? Um, we also looked at cropping rotations, so a lot of farmers have switched to autumn crops, um, and also we've looked at how many cereals um, are within rotations, cereals versus other crops. Um, and we looked at ploughing as well. Um, okay, so out, out of all of these, my main headline is that actually it only, only the number of applications 
that farmers apply in a year of any herbicide is what is driving the evolution of resistance. So this is contrary to all of the previous evidence, all of the industry advice and what the agrochemical companies want you to think. Okay, so herbicide intensity is what is driving evolution of resistance, not herbicide diversity, okay? So this is when we've already controlled for black grass density, we've already controlled for the type of herbicide and the soil type. Herbicide intensity is what is driving these populations and the evolution of resistance. If we look at the types of resistance, we can see that actually massively 82% of those populations were highly resistant to all three of those herbicides that we applied in those tests. Um, in this example here in the table, you can see the top, the top row there, only one herbicide had previously been applied to that field, but it was resistant to all three. In the second two examples, fields B and C, it previously had two, two herbicides applied, but it was resistant to a third. Okay, so this is strongly suggest suggestive of what we call non-target non site resistance, all right? So this is big trouble for farmers because this means that whatever herbicides they are throwing at those weeds, they are going to be resistant to them. All right, final question. What are the implications for farm businesses? So here we have uh, yield maps and black grass density. Here you can see there's a direct parallel. On the left map, the red areas represent um, the high densities of black grass. On the right map, you can see there's a corresponding area which actually represents the low yield areas. Not all of our maps are ni this nice and cleanly kind of related, but this is a nice one to show you. Um, so if we're looking, we've got data for 10, 10 fields, I think, on here. I am very quickly going to summarize this, all right. Um, then total yield losses range up to 12%, okay? So each of these dots here represents a field. But if you look within fields, you can see that there's a non-linear non relationship, okay? So at low and medium densities of the weed, it's not having any effect on your yield. So that would suggest that there is management potential there and that you don't need to manage when you have low densities of those weeds and that will reduce your likelihood of evolving resistance. Um, this is just some maths that we can go through at lunchtime if you're really interested, but essentially it has massive implications for farmers in terms of business plans because they're losing a lot of money and they're spending a lot of money on herbicides, they're spending a lot of money um, on treating this problem but not getting the yield benefits that they would like. They've still got massive yield losses, okay? All right, summary before you're all dying to get to lunch. Um, I've shown you that there are extensive numbers of weeds of black grass at the national and field scale. There's a positive relationship between survival and density. So this means that resistance is driving these high um, densities, um, the high levels of weed abundance that we see. The intensity um, of the herbicide application is what predicts the evolved resistance. It is not diversity of herbicides contrary to all previous evidence. Um, and to theory um, that populations resistant to one herbicide are likely to be resistant to all the herbicide tested, okay? It's a massive cost to farmers, it's a massive cost to yields, and I hope that I have convinced you that herbicide resistance and weed science is really important. Thank you. No, oh, everyone wants to go for lunch. Right, I'm around at lunchtime anyway if you do want to ask any questions. I'd just like to say thanks to all our speakers this morning. I think it's been a really interesting session.
So, ultimately, the minister. Who knows? We tried in the process, we tried in the quality issues.